we've already seen a couple of results that told us when we could lift a map to a covering space. For example, the path lifting lemma told us we could always lift a path to a covering space. A homotopy lifting lemma told us we could always lift a homotopy to a covering space. So here is a completely general result that tells us when we can lift a map to a covering space. So here's the setup. We have a space X. It's going to be our target space. And it has a covering space Y. And we have a test space T, which could be the interval if you're doing path lifting. It could be a square if you're doing homotopy lifting. In general, it's just any path connected, locally path connected space. And it'll become clear why we need these assumptions when we're proving the result. So this test space is mapping into X in some given way via a map F. And we want to find a map F tilde from T to the covering space Y so that the map F can be obtained by first going up along F tilde and then down along the covering map. In other words, P compose F tilde equals F. So if I do F tilde first, then P, that's the same as doing F. So the claim is we can find such a lift if a certain algebraic criterion holds. And moreover, the lift we find is unique if we specify some kind of initial condition on the map F tilde. This is just like in path lifting where we had to specify a start point for our path in the covering space. So to phrase this properly, let's pick a base point, little t, inside t, and let's call its image under the map F, X. And let's also pick a pre-image for X called little y in the covering space. So y is mapping down to X and little t is mapping to X as well. And the initial condition I want to put on my lift is that F tilde takes t to y, little t to little y. So that's this condition here. So the claim is there exists a unique lift f tilde of f that satisfies this initial condition f of little t equals what little y if and only if the following algebraic condition holds. So the condition says that if I take a loop in t based at little t and I push it forwards along the map f what I get is contained in the image of the map P star, which pushes loops down from the covering space to X. So let's see what that means. That means if I take a loop, let's say gamma, based at T, and I push it forwards along little f, and I get F star gamma. And what we're acquiring is that this loop, F star gamma, is the push forward of a loop based at y. In other words, there's something in the covering space that projects down to f star gamma. And obviously, if there is a lift f tilde, we could just take f tilde star gamma, because you know y projects down to little x, p compose f tilde equals f, so p star f tilde star of gamma equals f star gamma, which in particular tells us that for any loop gamma, f star of that loop is contained in the image of p star. So we see that this condition that's written down here is actually a necessary condition for the lift to hold. In other words, we've actually already proved the only if statement. So the difficulty here is to prove that this statement is sufficient in other words, if this algebraic condition holds, then we can find an F tilde. So I'm now going to give you a construction of this map F tilde. So we already know something about F tilde. We've assumed that F tilde is sending little t to y. So let's just start by defining it so that it sends little t to little y.
and now I need to tell you where it sends every other point in the test space, t. Well, we already know how to lift certain maps. We already know how to lift paths. So um, I'm going to pick another point, t prime, in the space t, and I'm going to pick a path from little t to little t prime, which I can do because t is path connected. This was one of the two assumptions I put on the space t. Okay, well, if I restrict f, this map here, to this path here, I get a path in x. And by path lifting, I get a unique path starting at y, lifting that path. So all I'm going to do is define the endpoint of that lifted path to be f tilde of t prime. So this is the construction of the map f tilde. Of course, I still need to check various things. I need to check that this map is a lift of f. I need to check that it's the unique lift of f satisfying this initial condition. I need to check that it's well defined. It's not clear that it's well defined because I had to pick a path to make this definition. And then, you know, what happens if I pick the different path? And I also need to check that it's a continuous map, which is not actually clear from this definition. So first of all, why is this a lift? Well, that's clear from the construction. Because whatever point this is, f tilde of t prime, it's a lift of the endpoint of this path. And the endpoint of this path is f of t prime. So in other words, for all t prime, f tilde of t prime projects via p to uh, f of t prime. In other words, we have this condition we want that p compose f tilde equals f. So it's definitely a lift. Moreover, uniqueness is quite easy to see because we already proved it. So when we proved the path lifting lemma, we separated out the uniqueness part into a separate lemma of its own, which actually is precisely the uniqueness statement for this lifting criterion. So I'm, I'm not going to prove uniqueness because we've already seen it. So I want to prove this map is well defined. So to that end, let's pick two different paths from t to t prime. Let's give them names, let's maybe call them alpha 1 and alpha 2. So alpha 1 is going to go to a path f of alpha 1 in x, and alpha 2 is going to go to a path f of alpha 2. And the key thing to spot is that they start and end at the same point. Well, they both start at x because t goes to x, and they both end at the point f of t prime. I'm going to use both of these maps to construct the map f tilde applied to the point t prime, and I want to check that I get the same thing from each of them. So the idea is the following. I look at the loop, which I'm going to draw in blue, that goes once along alpha 1 and then backwards along alpha 2. So in my notation that's alpha 2 inverse dot alpha 1. Let's give that a name, let's call it gamma. That's a loop based at t. And its image is this, this green loop that you can see over here, which I'm now going to go over in blue. It goes along f alpha 1 and then backwards along f alpha 2. So this is f of gamma. Now by assumption, f star of the homotopy class of gamma is contained in the image of p star. This was the algebraic condition that we were assuming. What does this mean? 
It means there is a loop which I'll draw up here based at y which uh, maybe I will call delta which projects down to f gamma in other words this is a lift of the loop f of gamma and now what I claim is that f tilde Defined using alpha 1, so I put a subscript 1 of t prime, equals delta of a half, in other words, the point halfway along delta, and it's also equal to f tilde 2 of t prime, which is, right, this is what I want to prove. I want to prove that f1 tilde of t prime is the same as f2 tilde of t prime. In other words, the f tilde I construct doesn't depend on whether I use alpha 1 or alpha 2. And the reason for this equality here is that this half, this first half of delta that goes along the top bit here, is a lift of f of alpha 1. So by definition, wherever it ends is f tilde 1 of t prime. And that's this point here. Which is exactly halfway along delta. So that proves this half of the equality. And the point is that if I go backwards along delta the other way for time a half, that lifts f of alpha 2. So I get to the same point, and that tells me that f tilde 2 of t prime is also equal to delta of a half. So in particular, it's equal to f tilde 1 of t prime. So in other words, f tilde doesn't depend on the path you use to define it. So now the trickiest bit of the proof is to prove that f tilde is continuous. So here are our spaces again. I'm going to make them a little bit bigger. So this is the covering space y. This is x. This is the covering map P. Here's our test space T. And the test map F. So to prove that this map F tilde is continuous, I need to take an open set in Y. Let's call it V. And I need to look at its pre-image under F tilde and show that that's open. So what we want is f tilde inverse of v to be open. In fact, I don't need to prove this for all open sets v. It's sufficient to prove it for a base of the topology, because then I can prove it for all other open sets by taking unions. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use the following kinds of open sets I'm going to take an open set U in X, which is an elementary open set. Now, if you remember, that means that we have a well-defined local inverse Q for P defined on U. And we may have many local inverses, one for each component of P inverse U. So we're going to take V to be just one of the many uh, pre-images of u. All right, so if x was the circle, you know, u, u could be the complement of a single point. And if, if y was the covering space that winds infinitely often round it, then the pre-image of that interval will be a collection of infinitely many intervals upstairs. I'm just picking one of them as my v. So I want to show that such open sets have the property that f tilde inverse of v is open. So, well, let's pick a point. Let's call it uh, t prime in t. It's not necessarily our base point. And let's suppose that it maps to v 
along f tilde. So this is uh, f tilde of t prime. And that lives above f of t prime, which is in u. So to prove that f tilde inverse of v is open, I need to find an open set around t prime, which is contained in the preimage of f tilde inverse of v. And because t prime is arbitrary inside f tilde inverse of v, any point in f tilde inverse of v will have an open set inside f tilde inverse of v. So f tilde inverse of v will be open. Okay, so what's this uh, open set over here? Uh, let me call it W. What's W going to be? Well, what open sets do I actually have lying around? I have U, which is unfortunately over here. But F is a continuous map. So I can look at the pre-image of U and I get some open set over here. So W is going to be contained inside, I'm going to pick W inside F inverse of U. And the way I'm going to pick it is, I'm going to just take it to be a path-connected neighbourhood of T prime. Path-connected, open set, containing T prime. And I can do that because I'm assuming that the space T, the test space, is locally path-connected. So I can always take a smaller open set, which is path-connected. Now, how do we prove then that W is contained in F tilde inverse of V? That's what we need to do. Well, let's take another point, maybe T prime prime in W. Uh, well, how would I define F tilde of T prime prime? I would pick a path from the base point T to T prime prime. Unfortunately, I can't see the base point anymore, but I have a path that comes from the base point to T prime that I use to define F tilde of T prime. So I'm going to concatenate that with another little path containing this path connected neighborhood that goes from T prime to T prime prime. So that maps to another path in U. that goes from f of t prime to f of t prime prime. And if I compose that with q, the local inverse defined on this elementary open set u, I'm going to get a path inside v that connects f tilde t prime to the point which is necessarily by construction f tilde of t prime prime. So lo and behold, if we start with an, a t prime prime that's connected to t prime by a path, such that the path maps inside u, entirely inside u, the elementary open set, then f tilde of t prime prime is contained in v. In other words, f tilde inverse of v contains w, which is what we wanted. Right, this proves that f tilde inverse of v is covered by open sets in the test space t. So in particular, it's an open set. OK, so that proves that f tilde is a continuous map. So just in case you're completely befuddled by what we've just done, let's recap. We've given you a purely algebraic condition to determine whether or not a, a map F, a continuous map, from some test space into X lifts to a continuous lift F tilde from the test space into a covering space Y. 
The criterion was that the push forward along F of the fundamental group of the test space is contained in the push forward along P of the fundamental group of Y. So we really needed that to prove that our construction was well defined. That's the place where we used that condition. There was also a slightly technical and lengthy digression to prove that this lift was continuous. The idea of the construction of F tilde was to take a path in the test space, map it forwards along F to a path in X, and then lift that path to the covering space using the path lifting lemma that we've already proved. And the end point of that path is defined to be F tilde of wherever the path ended in T. So here's a nice application of this fact. Let's suppose I start with um, a sphere, two-dimensional sphere. And I want to look at maps from that sphere to the torus, two-dimensional torus. The question is, how many such maps are there up to homotopy? Well, I can think of one, right? There's a stupid map. There's a map that takes the whole sphere to a point. The constant map. And I claim there are no others up to homotopy. Reason being, universal cover of a T2 is the Euclidean plane. Right? If you divide the plane by the Z2 action, that translates by an integer amount in the horizontal and vertical directions and take the quotient, then uh, you get the two torus. And that's a covering map, B. And this is a test map from a simply connected space. So by our lifting criterion, F star of pi 1 of S2 based at any point. Let's fix point T is the trivial group, which is certainly contained in P star of pi 1 R2, based again at any point Y. I mean, because this is itself the trivial group, so it certainly contains the trivial group. So, there exists a lift, F tilde, from the sphere to R2. R2 is a contractible space, so any map from the sphere to R2 is homotopic to a constant map. And we can compose that homotopy with the projection P to get a null homotopy of F. So let's write that down. Uh, F tilde is, let's say, H of 1, right? The H1 is the, there's a homotopy HT, such that H1 is F tilde, and the constant map is H0. And now HT is mapping to R2, so P compose HT is a null homotopy. of F. So this proves there are no interesting maps from the sphere to the torus in dimension 2. Another way of saying this, if you like fancy words, is that pi 2 of T2 is trivial. Alright, so pi 1 was mapped from the circle into your space based at some point. Pi 2 is mapped from the 2 sphere Pi 3 will be matched from the 3 sphere, etc. So actually this allows you to compute all the higher homotopy groups of, of the torus.